So recently I was on a rotation where I was asked to make a short five to 10 minute presentation. Uh, and I thought it would be really helpful to make some PowerPoints and really just make them super quick using images from Google because there's so many good resources, tables, and pictures on Google already that really I could just compile them all, make it into a PowerPoint. It's something that takes very little time, but I think uh, could be a nice, easy way to make a short presentation for people. So uh, the one that they asked me to make was uh, on endocarditis. So it's just going to be a really brief overview of endocarditis. Uh, a couple things that uh, I want to go over is some of the pimp questions that you might get. So what are some of the different categories used to classify endocarditis? What kind of endocarditis often presents with vague, nonspecific symptoms over weeks? Uh, how do you officially diagnose endocarditis? What are some of the immunologic and vascular phenomena of endocarditis? How can you differentiate between Osler's nodes and Janeway lesions? How long should you give antibiotics for endocarditis? And finally, who or what are the indications for surgery in people with endocarditis? So let's get straight into it. And this is just all like basically images I pulled from Google that I thought were, were good at explaining the basic setup or the best basic foundation for endocarditis. So this first one is endocarditis can really be split up into two primary categories, and that is infective versus non-infective endocarditis. And then once you get into infective, you can split it up further into culture positive versus culture negative endocarditis. So the non-infective endocarditis, this is also known as merantic endocarditis or non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. Uh, and there's three main causes for this. This could be due to a hypercoagulable state. Uh, oftentimes you think of like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Uh, it could be due to rheumatic uh, disease or it could be due to malignancy, especially pancreatic cancer, I think is one of the more common ones that causes NBTE. Uh, in terms of infective, going back here, if you look at culture positive and culture negative endocarditis, the uh, most common cause of culture negative endocarditis is coxiella. And then the other common list of organisms you might be asked is the HASEC uh, organisms. And this stands for these organisms right here, which were uh, considered culture negative causes of endocarditis. Although uh, with improvements in blood culture technology, a lot of these uh, organisms can now be detected on blood cultures. So they're not really technically culture negative sometimes at this point. And then the treatment is often SF triaxone. So uh, besides that, uh, there's another way, okay, there's like a third way that you can uh, differentiate different types of endocarditis, and that would be native valve endocarditis and prosthetic valve endocarditis. And the organisms that would be involved would be different in these two different categories. And then, of course, you have this categorization, which is acute versus subacute endocarditis. So acute will typically be your staph, your strep, and your enterococcus. Uh, and then with your subacute, it's oftentimes those culture-negative organisms, like the HASEC organisms, uh, the coxiella, et cetera. Et cetera. So uh, one thing I just wanted to quickly note is that fever is the most common symptom of uh, endocarditis. And you can see that it happens in about 93.6% of patients here. Uh, and then in this study, in about 90% of patients. Uh, when you're looking at some of those other findings that we learned, you know, uh, splinter hemorrhage, Osler nodes, uh, Janeway lesions, these are all very rare uh, findings compared to just having a plain old fever. So while you should look at all, the, you know, all your patients for these symptoms or signs, you oftentimes may not see them. So how do we diagnose uh, bacterial endocarditis? So the main way to diagnose is with the uh, Duke criteria. Uh, very important to know. So you either need to have two major, one plus three, or five minor criteria. And the major criteria uh, include positive blood cultures uh, and a positive echo. And these ones are kind of less uh, common, persistent bacteremia and positive serology for coxiella. And then you have these five minor criteria, which are predisposing heart disease, fever, uh, immunological phenomena, uh, vascular phenomena, and microbiological evidence not fitting major criteria. So what does that mean? What are these immunological phenomena and vascular phenomena? And the answer to that is that uh, immunological phenomena, you call these here, the, which are the Roth spots in the eye. Um, so you get these little uh, fluffy lesions in the eye. And then uh, this here is Osler's node. And this one down here is Janeway lesions. 
And so Osler's nodes are immunologic phenomena, which are caused by like complement uh, deposition uh, and binding of complement. Whereas vascular phenomena are like, you know, splinter hemorrhages where you have tiny little emboli that go off and they finally get to the most distal part of the finger and get lodged there and cause a hemorrhage uh, and Janeway lesions. And the way you can differentiate Osler's nodes from Janeway lesions is that Osler's nodes are painful whereas Janeway lesions are not painful. So sometimes you can remember it as the Ausler's nodes because they hurt. Here are some other immunologic phenomena. You have glomerulonephritis, Osler's nodes, raw spots, and rheumatoid factor. And other vascular phenomena include emboli, pulmonary infarcts, uh, hemorrhage, conjunctival hemorrhages, and Janeway lesions. So uh, one thing to note is that immunologic phenomena can occur with either left or right-sided endocarditis, uh, but vascular phenomena only occur with left-sided endocarditis, except for these pulmonary infarcts could be both. Uh, but that makes sense because if you have uh, a septic emboli coming from your heart, if it's coming from the left side of the heart, it could go to your fingernails and cause a splinter hemorrhage. But if it's coming from the right side of your heart, it's not going to go to your fingernails. It's going to go to your lungs and just lodge in the lungs instead. All right, treatment. So uh, according to UpToDate, at least three sets of blood cultures should be drawn from separate sites prior to starting antibiotics, which I did not know that you had, you're supposed to get three. Uh, in stable patients, you can defer antibiotics until the cultures are back. If they're unstable, you should start empiric antibiotics after blood cultures are obtained. In practice, I think most people just start the antibiotics right away, uh, right after blood cultures are obtained. And then finally, you should always get an echo right away. Um, so you can calculate your Duke criteria and see if you can diagnose it based off the group Duke criteria. Uh, the duration of therapy should be calculated from the first day of negative cultures. And sorry, I know my webcam is blocking a little bit here. And then in terms of treatment duration for native valve endocarditis, uh, the duration is typically four to six weeks. So most of these patients are going to need some kind of pick line for IV antibiotics once they go home. Uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis, on the other hand, is more difficult and may require surgery. And then another thing to note is that you should get another echo at the end of treatment to establish a new baseline to check if there's still any regurgitation or stenosis uh, to see if there's any change in their EF, for example. And then last point is indications for surgery. For native valve endocarditis, some of the indications for surgery are if it's causing congestive heart failure, if there's periannular extension, so near the valve, it's starting to spread to other structures. And then obviously, if you have difficult organisms, prosthetic valves, other complications like that, those are some indications to consult uh, surgery for possible surgical intervention. So I hope this was a helpful video for you. If you liked the video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.